Well, thank you very much. So you're all graduate students? And what, what fields? Mecha chemical? chemical? Mechanical? Mechanical. How many mechanicals? I'm a mechanical. Not, I, 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 have, I advise materials students as well as chemical engineering and uh, mechanical and aerospace uh, engineering students. So um, thank, thank you for the very nice introduction. Uh, I'd like to kind of give you kind of a view of uh, our facilities and where, where we work. Uh, this is uh, Zucro Labs. This is an office building. And then we have several different laboratories. This uh, propulsion lab is one of the oldest. That's where we do a lot of our work. And this is our newest facility. It's uh, dedicated last year. And in fact, this is uh, uh, another view of that. The, the thing about that that's very unique is the full length. It's like 100 feet. I guess I'd convert that to meters, huh? So th 30, 30 meters long and uh, about 20 feet wide in this area. And, uh, and that is a big laser lab. But the thing that makes it unique is it's connected to these large test cells. And in most of the test cells, uh, we, we test uh, jet engine, combustion types of uh, systems, turbulent combustion. And these three, uh, and this one on the end, turbine blades. So there's a lot of air breathing propulsion, rocket propulsion. Most of the rocket propulsion is back over here. And in this test cell, we do some energetic materials. And I'll, I'll kind of define what energy materials are in a minute. Uh, here's some of our other facilities. Um, this is a, a new lab. It's a, a multidisciplinary lab. We call it the Flex Lab. So it's flexible for different parts of uh, different engineering uh, departments have space. And our Energetics Research Center has a lab space here. This is one of our new faculty that synthesizes um, energetic materials. So it makes new molecules, new propellants and explosives and so forth. And that's where his main lab is now. And this is Herrick Lab. It has a lot of industrial um, connections, a lot of heating, cooling. The whole building actually is a laboratory for heating, cooling types of things. And we do uh, some uh, inkjet printing of nanoscale thermites. Anybody know what a thermite is? I know John does. OK. So this, this must be your group over here, John. Right? <laughs> so it's like metal, metal oxides. And so we, and we we're printing some other energy materials as well. And I'm going to talk more about some other additive manufacturing that we, we do as well. But we do uh, that at, at that building. Here's a couple other facilities that our energy uh, research center uh, uses. Uh, and this, this is our, uh, our engineering uh, college headquarters as well as aerospace and materials engineering. And in the basement of that, there's uh, gas guns, so high rate mechanics, so you shoot projectiles fast into things and break things and study that. Uh, Professor Wayne Chen is uh, our, our key person for that. This is Boeing Lab, uh, where he has uh, most, mostly what goes on in there is civil engineering. You have buildings, and they have big uh, earthquake simulators. But he, he has a lot labs in, in, the, in the underbelly of it with uh, big, long, does anybody know what Kolsky bars are, Hopkinson bars? It's basically high rate mechanics of looking at uh, including energetic materials. So, what are energetic materials? Uh, they're combustible materials that you don't need any extra oxidizer. So they, they carry their oxidizer you know, with them. Uh, that's in contrast to like gasoline and uh, hydrocarbon fuels where you're normally burning uh, with, with the oxygen in the air. Uh, like most combustion systems, it's very temperature sensitive in terms of the reaction rate. So they could be stably stored for a long time, and then when you uh, need to ignite them, then you apply ignition uh, source to that. Think of your airbags in your, in your car. They're, they're there. They're uh, hopefully going to be uh, ready to go when you, when you need them. And you apply an ignition, and then they can react uh, very quickly, uh, produce a lot of gas in that case. Uh, a lot of times, energetic materials produce a lot of heat as well. And it's easy to. Well, one way to, to differentiate energetic materials is by their applications. There's energetic materials used for explosives, and not just for military, but also for uh, road construction, building construction, so forth. Uh, propellants, and that could be gun, rocket, types of propulsion, uh, and pyrotechnics. Somebody said they wanted to come to the seminar because it was fireworks. So pyrotechnics uh, fit into that area, but there's also military applications for, for pyrotechnics, uh, countermeasures, flares, those kinds of things. 
uh, delay charges. So since not all of you are combustion scientists, I thought I'd define combustion a little bit. Uh, combustion includes both deflagration and detonation. So you might say, well, wait a minute. It's like, I thought combustion means just burning. No, I mean, it, you, you can burn in different ways. A deflagration is co commonly what you, th you would call combustion or burning. And it's a reactive wave. It burns through a material uh, propagated by diffusional processes. So heat conduction, mass diffusion. And that's what's throwing the energy forward and heating fresh material up to an ignition point. And then that reacted material is driving the energy that's uh, propagating that wave. So this is an explosive material. And it's just deflagrating. This is the, the same, oh, let's see, I'll show that again, didn't repeat. This is the same material, goes up, hits a detonator, and that detonates. And you probably think, well, detonation, explosion, isn't that the same thing? All detonations are explosions, but not every explosion is a detonation. A detonation is also a reactive wave. It's a, a, a you know, subset of combustion where you have, you, it involves a shock wave. And then behind that, you have reactions. And the uh, reactions provide the energy uh, to sustain that shock wave. Usually, if you, you put a shock wave into something, you, you hit it hard or push on it with a hard, you know, hard with a piston or something like that, that shock wave will dissipate with time. If you have a shock wave with reaction behind it, and that material that, uh, can detonate, that reaction will sustain itself, and it will sustain that shock as long as you have that explosive material. So how is the energy transported? There's some chemis in here, so transport phenomena is a familiar term to you. How is that energy trans uh, transported forward in a detonation? Well, it's actually by acoustics. So the reaction behind the shock wave um, uh, produces energy and, and, and pressure. And that, those pressure, that energy is transported up forward acoustically, and basically it piles up into that shock wave and sustains that shock wave. So it's a, a very interesting phenomena. Um, usually when you think of an explosion, it's like, oh, this, all this chaos and there's, there's nothing really ordered or uh, that you can understand in detail, but uh, it's a very precise thing. So I'm going to talk a lot about solid propellants. So I want to kind of explain what typical solid propellants are. So if you think of, uh, of a solid propellant, a composite propellant, it has uh, two or three components. Uh, one component is a, a rubbery binder that holds it all together. The rest of it are, par are particles. Uh, so some of those particles are oxygen rich. We call those oxidizers. You can think of those powders looking a lot like uh, salt or, or table sugar, uh, but you don't eat it. It actually will take your thyroid out generally. Uh, it's a, like ammonium perchlorate, so it has a lot of oxygen. And uh, the binder not only holds things together, but it's multifunctional. It, uh, it's the fuel. And, and often, and this is a shuttle, and this is a solid rocket motor. And this is a, a schematic of these. This would be the oxidizer. Uh, we also put aluminum powder into propellants. Uh, for example, with the, the shuttle rocket uh, uh, motors. So why do we put aluminum in, into uh, a solid propellant? Any ideas? It's a, sensitizer. a sensitizer? Nope. <laughs> nope. It, it does a little bit, but that's not the main reason. It can pull the oxygen off the iron. Uh, if you put iron in there, it, it, well, iron oxide. Iron oxide is a, a catalyst that you sometimes put in propellants as well. Aluminum is another fuel, and it raises the temperature a lot. Okay, so uh, if, if there's no aerospace engineers here, right? We don't have aerospace engineering. But if there were, they would tell you if you want to improve the performance of a rocket, you want to raise the temperature, and you want to lower the molecular weight. Well, aluminum doesn't help you with the molecular weight, but it does raise the temperature a lot. And so that improves the, the combustion efficiency and what they call, you know, uh, they look at as specific impulse. So we'll talk about uh, actually putting other metals in. So I'm, I'm basically a combustion guy. I like to burn things, and, and my world is either oxidizers or fuel. So everything is, could be uh, part of a combustion system. So when I see aluminum, when I think about aluminum, I go, well, that's a fuel. Uh, if I look at other things, like fluoropolymers, for example, 
That's an oxidizer. It has fluorine. So that, you know, so you could take aluminum. So your frying pan has a Teflon and an aluminum. You, t you guys are mostly interested in, in nano energetic or nanotechnology, right? Well, if you take, you know, nanoscale Teflon particles, nanoscale aluminum particles, mix those together, and you've got an energetic material. And it's right there in your frying pan. So this is a, a strand of propellant burning. So this, uh, you know, one thing we like to do is be able to tailor the performance. And some recent things we've done is, uh, and I mentioned iron oxide as a catalyst. We've encapsulated catalysts in ammonium perchlorate, which I said is a, a typical oxidizer in propellants. And we do that by um, a very simple, we're, we're mechanical engineers, so we've got to do simple things with, uh, with chemistry types of stuff. So we do a solvent, anti-solvent crystallization process. We suspend the, the catalysts, which are nanoscale iron oxide, and we've used uh, other, other materials as well, graphene that w has suspended uh, nano catalysts as well. We, we have that in our, in our solvent, we dissolve the ammonium perchlorate, we add in an anti-solvent, and those nanoparticles act as nucleation sites for the crystal growth, so the crystals grow around the catalyst. So why would you do all that in, in a solid propellant? You could just throw it into the solid propellant, which is typically done, and the binder could hold it all together. But the, the oxidizer crystals are, are, are the component of the propellant that really needs the, the catalytic uh, performance and the improvement. In addition, the catalysts that are in contact with these polymeric binders, they're like rubbery materials. In fact, the, the final solid propellant is like a, a pencil eraser. It's kind of a rubbery type of material. Uh, the catalyst that if you just mix it in, which is traditionally done, into the, the binder system, it catalyzes the aging of the polymer. So there's some material scientists in here. You know that polymers degrade with time. So your, your solid propellant can degrade with time as those catalysts accelerate that aging. You don't want that. So it's, it's better to put it inside the crystals. We showed that it's more effective in catalyzing the burning. One other effect is if you, if you think about this composite material, it has to have good mechanical uh, properties because if it starts to form cracks inside your rocket motor, the flames will go down to the cracks and that'll open new cracks and then you have a, an explosion rather than uh, propulsion. And if you bring in, and, and catalysts, you want high surface area. That they work better if you have more surface area. So you like the nano, nano size, but if you want to put that into your propellant, you have to sometimes add more binder if it's really high, high surface area catalyst. And you don't want to do that because you're, you're, you're starved for oxygen already. You're, you're trying to bring in as much ammonia perchlorate, perchlorate as possible. So to bring in a really high surface area catalyst, you have to sacrifice performance. But if you put the catalyst inside the crystals, you basically, we talked, John and I talked about core shell types of materials. That's a kind of core shell material. Put the catalyst inside the crystal. You don't have to have the binder hold that all together. Uh, we've also looked at, and I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, uh, looking at um, micron-sized aluminum particles, which is typically used in propellants. Uh, over the last, you know, couple decades, people have looked at nanoscale uh, particles uh, added to uh, propellants. But what we did is um, micron aluminum particles that have nanoscale features. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, alloyed metals. So uh, aluminum is used everywhere in propellants, explosive, and pyrotechnics. Uh, we looked at a, an alloyed uh, material, aluminum lithium, uh, because it has some really interesting uh, properties. We can, we can apply we can um, apply th just thermal chemistry calculations and show that theoretically we would get better performance. Remember what I said, a specific impulse improves if we have lower molecular weight or higher temperature. The temperature drops a little bit with aluminum lithium versus aluminum, but the molecular weight drops enough that the performance goes up. But just as interestingly, the lithium is halophilic. Now you're all engineers, so you're like, what the heck is halophilic? Does anybody know? Yeah, that literally means it loves halogens. Halogens like chlorine, ammonium perchlorate. So it has chlorine in there, so rock, the typical solid propellant produces HCl. What do you think HCl does to your launch site and you know, you know, acid rain, all that stuff? Not, not a great thing, right? It'd be nice to get rid of that, but people have looked at additives and it kills performance. You're, you're, you're cutting the energy. Uh, the lithium, being halophilic, forms lithium chloride instead of lithium oxide. And so it ties up that chlorine and, and, uh, 
and you produce hydrogen instead without the HCl. Uh, so it's, it's less toxic uh, pollutants and less caustic. And then, uh, and I'll talk about this as well, we've uh, done some uh, reactive wires, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what that is. It's basically kind of blending pyrotechnics uh, with, with propellants. And, and now, and I'll talk some more about this too, we've done some additive manufacturing. I mentioned with inkjet printing, but also fused deposition and a viscous printing. So metallic fuels, and like I said, um, it's, it's perfectly normal for us to think about burning metals, and we do all the time. But let's, let's think about, has anybody heard of emulsion fuels or emissive fuels? If you burn liquids, um, you, know, t you know, often you have, it, all liquids are a, a mixture of different hydrocarbon, you know, fuels. And so, and, and often those are emissive. They mix well with each other, okay? Water and alcohol are emissive, right? They, they mix well. There's also emulsion fuels. So think of like a fuel oil, and you force like water to, you know, you know water and oil doesn't, they don't mix naturally. If you force that to mix, maybe using some surfactants and agitation and so forth, you, you make an emulsion. So it could be a fuel oil with tiny droplets inside there of, of water. When that's heated in a combustion system, it could shatter and micro explode uh, those, those liquids. Likewise, if you have missive fuels, but the volatility, the boiling point of the constituents are very different, you can have conditions such that the, the droplets will micro explode, sort of self atomize and uh, form smaller uh, droplets that could burn faster, more uh, complete combustion, et cetera. So on metals, um, an, an analogy to the emulsion fuels is what we call mechanical activation. If you want to think of it just, just really crudely, we, we take a ball mill, uh, we, you know, balls inside of uh, containers that are almost like a, a crazy carnival ride and smash the materials. You think, well, that's going to, you know, make it smaller under the right conditions. Yeah, you, you do mill and make smaller particles. Under the other conditions, you can take two constituents, say a polymer with aluminum, and smash or intertwine these materials together, even down to nanoscale uh, features. You could also build that up from bottom up, which is, I think, all, all the, the nanotechnology, you think of that, those kinds of things, and we, we do uh, work with collaborators on that kind of uh, thing as well. But you can come up with a particle that if you look close, yeah, there's some metal, say aluminum, and there's some polymer, could be a fluoropolymer, could be a, a hydrocarbon intertwined inside that aluminum. And that dramatically changes how that particle ignites, could ignite much easier. And uh, as it burns and heats up, it can burst apart. The, 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 the polymer could uh, gasify and, and, and uh, disrupt that particle. Uh, alloys are an analogy to emissive uh, liquid fuels. And, uh, and so we've looked at, uh, in particular, this aluminum lithium. We also looked at other alloys, uh, but this one, you know, the, the theory, the, th the thermal chemistry says, okay, look, this, this could be good for both uh, cutting the HCl emission as well as performance. So, uh, and and I'll, I'll show that it also has the properties because lithium is much more volatile, lower boiling point. It can micro explode the particles uh, into smaller droplets and that can uh, very importantly improve performance. Um, and this is just a schematic of how we, uh, in a very top-down method, uh, almost like, you know, sledgehammer approach to making uh, nano-featured materials, uh, we put uh, aluminum and, in this case, Teflon. And what do I say about fluoropolymers? To me, those are oxidizers. So this is an interesting composite particle in that it has uh, some oxygen, or in this case, fluorine, which is an oxidizer for the aluminum. This is a, a, a SEM image of that particle, this is 10 micro. So it's, it's actually micron sized, which has advantages in that it could be a drop in replacement for just aluminum powders. Uh, this is uh, looking at the, the uh, uh, EDS, the electrodispersive spectroscopy. The green here doesn't show up too well, but it's very well dispersed throughout that particle. So we've got Teflon throughout that particle, and uh, it is a, a nanoscale inclusion. So if we put that into propellants, this is the baseline aluminized propellant. This is the surface, if you look closely here. 
You can see these particles. Some of these particles you can see uh, tells. That's a alumina smoke coming off from that particle. And this is the, what we call mechanically active, activated 70-30, uh, so 70% aluminum, 30% PTFE or Teflon. If you look at the surface, there's a lot more bright spots. It's igniting right at the surface rather than uh, as, as the, it regresses down and then ignites. And, and uh, you also see a lot more streaking. That means there's small particles. So what's happened is these uh, composite particles uh, ignite more readily at the surface, break apart into smaller particles. Uh, and that's, um, uh, like I said, it, it'll improve the burning rate. Uh, 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 combustion efficiency, especially in small rocket motors. Uh, and also there's a, uh, a, 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 a loss that occurs. It's called a two-phase full loss in, in rocket motors. So uh, as the, the products of the combustion, so what does aluminum go to? What is, when it's oxidized, it goes to alumina, Al2O3. And in a rocket motor, that's liquid. So you actually have liquid droplets. Uh, it's combusted uh, aluminum that clunks its way out through the nozzle. It can also be slag in, in the rocket motor, neither of which uh, help your performance. They cut into your performance. An easy way to think about why that's the case is think about a hot alumina droplet going through your nozzle. And uh, to get the best performance, you would like all of that thermal energy from that droplet to be conducted out to the gas. That gas is just not going to expand as well, and you're not going to get the thrust as well if you don't get that energy conducted to the, the gas. If you have small droplets, that's going to be very fast and it's going to be close to equilibrium, and you'll have lower two-phase full losses. And that, those losses can be as much as 10-15% uh, of, of your performance. Solid, current solid rocket motors just eat that and say, okay, well, that's the best we can do. It's, it's great. Aluminum brought the temperature up, and we'll just suffer with that loss. Uh, this just shows some, we uh, burn strands and collect the particles. This is the baseline uh, propellant, and you can see large uh, alumina particles that we collect for the uh, modified, this uh, mechanically activated uh, material. You can just visibly see, and we've quantified this, of course, and as there's a lot smaller products. Smaller products will result in lower two-phase full losses and better performance for, for your rocket. As I mentioned, uh, we also have looked at alloys. Um, there's some of you in materials science, engineering, right? So you guys love the... Uh, these kinds of uh, plots, right? These phase diagrams. And for the, the materials engineers in here, it, we're looking at a one-to-one -one atomic uh, aluminum lithium. That's a lot higher content of lithium than what you normally see in a structural material. Usually for a structural aluminum lithium, that's on airplanes we fly on. Uh, there's uh, you know, maybe under 5% lithium by weight. In this case, it's 20% by weight. Lithium's lighter than aluminum, but it's one-to-one -one atomic forms a, a very nice alloy. You look at the boiling point. The boiling point of lithium is uh, 1300 C and some change. Uh, aluminum, much higher. So we have a, a disparity in boiling points. And so I'll, I'll talk more about why that's important. If we, th if we throw this into some propellant strands and burn it, uh, what can you notice differently about this? So the strands right here is maybe a quarter inch. This is a uh, high-speed imaging, maybe a thousand frames per second. Otherwise, it would look like a firework. So, if, you know, those that you wanted to come to see fireworks, you've, you've seen some fireworks with a high-speed camera. A couple things I notice on this is uh, you see particles burning far away from the strand. Here, the biggest thing that stands out is the color. And that's uh, lithium will burn kind of a magenta. To me, it looks pink. And then look at all the dark space. What does that mean? Those particles are are pretty much consumed uh, and done uh, before they move very far uh, downstream. And also kind of seems to be kind of uh, exploding in an interesting way. Let's look microscopically. We, we do some backlit, uh, high-speed uh, microscopic imaging. The smallest particles you see here, these, those are aluminum particles. That's, those are about 30 microns to give you a scale. The largest the droplets here are several hundreds of microns, maybe the diameter of your hair. This is all pretty small stuff. But you can see the, as this surface burns back, and we're not really seeing the flames because of the backlight and, and so forth. And then you see these aluminum droplets. 
and the, the smoke coming off from them is uh, the alumina, uh, and the alumina will, will agglomerate in big droplets, and that goes clunking out through your nozzle. If you watch really close, you can see uh, you know, that it's not just a spherical droplet, but there's like this knob. That's an alumina, they call an oxide cap. Um, but this has been seen before. I think we did a pretty good job of imaging it, but th this is nothing new. This is typical. If we replace the aluminum, uh, with, uh, the aluminum with aluminum lithium alloy, the whole surface changes kind of its characteristics. It's, it's uh, kind of bubbling on the surface. It'll throw off droplets. And then you can clearly see these micro explosions. The droplets just self disintegrate. Um, so what's going on there? Also, in recent, recent work and, and stuff we're going to uh, begin looking at is to understand if there's reactions with that lithium uh, at or near the surface. I really think there are based on some data. So this is how we've, we've explained what's going on. If we, have, if we start off with the initial particle, and particles may not be uh, spherical. And in fact, these particles aren't very spherical. Uh, as that's heated, it be, forms a molten droplet. Uh, if it's just a single component, say aluminum, that uh, droplet could be consumed, becoming smaller, perhaps. If we have an alloy uh, with a, a multiple component, the, the more volatile component, the, the component that boils at a lower temperature, in this case lithium, will boil off that surface very quickly. And the lithium near the surface doesn't have to diffuse very far. And so it diffuses and, and goes to gas. Uh, and that leaves the aluminum that's uh, not, not boiling yet. So you have kind of a shell here of aluminum. And under certain conditions, and if, if you watch enough of these high-speed videos, you see almost like little volcanoes coming off uh, that, uh, that droplet. We call that a, a dispersive boiling type of phenomena. Or you get um, a case, cases where the, the entire core of uh, that droplet flashes to gas, and we call that a shattering microexplosion, and we saw uh, evidence of that. So why the, the different uh, phenomena, and what's, what's going on here? So this graph helps us kind of visualize uh, what, what's happening. And in, in short, what you have is um, as you heat uh, the, the droplet, uh, the more volatile component, in this case lithium, can become superheated stays a liquid, doesn't have anything to nucleate and, and form a gas. So it, it, get, it gets above its boiling point, but it stays a liquid. There's clear examples. You look on YouTube, you've got you know, smooth beakers. You put you know, with uh, um, pure water into a microwave, and then you throw a spoon in it. It'll, it'll flash the gas. That's what superheat is, is about. And there's a couple of different cases here drawn with the dashed line and, and uh, the, the solid line. In the, with, on the solid line, well, and I should say too, so you know, it's, it's superheated, you keep heating it up, it gets to a point where it says, I can't take this anymore, and it flashes to gas. You exceed the superheat limit, that's this TSH. And um, so for dispersive boiling, you may have part of that droplet uh, above the boiling point of the volatile component, that's what this line is. And so when that exceeds the, uh, the superheat limit, uh, th this region will flash to gas, but not the whole droplet, and you'll have this uh, dispersive boiling, kind of volcanic type of uh, boiling. And in the other case, with a shattering microexplosion, you could have you know, pretty much the entire core superheated. You exceed that superheat limit, and that whole core flashes to gas and shatters the droplet. Um, a former student of mine started a company, Adronos Energetics. This is uh, 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 Brandon Terry, who's the founder of the company. And he's transitioned this technology to doing rocket motor tests. Uh, he developed a coating of the aluminum lithium. When we did our work at Purdue, uh, we used uncoated aluminum lithium. As you, as you might imagine, if you know anything about uh, uh, lithium or sodium, those kinds of metals, uh, they're very, very reactive. Uh, in the alloy, it's more protected. The aluminum helps protect it, but moisture and air will still degrade it and slowly react it, uh, so it makes it unsafe to scale to a rocket motor. Uh, and so he developed a coating of, of those alloys uh, and scaled it to rocket motor testing. 
And this is the baseline aluminized propellant. Uh, the same uh, exposure on the camera. So this is a lot brighter. If you look closely, you can see streaks. Those are large droplets, maybe unburned aluminum particles coming out of the nozzle. In contrast, the uh, aluminum lithium, uh, I should have said aluminum lithium. I have a typo there. This is aluminum lithium. First of all, you see that you have the pink color. color uh, and the, the plume is a lot less intense. It's a little lower temperature. Uh, plus, the, the particle size coming out of the nozzle must be much smaller. And you can actually see some structures here. Those are actually shock diamonds uh, that you typically don't see in solid uh, rocket motor plumes. Liquid rocket motors, you see that. Um, so both those things are very interesting. They measured uh, performance. And the performance is actually higher than I would have even hoped for. Uh, I'm not sure he's, he's allowing me, allowed me to tell you the exact performance, but it uh, looks very good. And he's working with the company to uh, try to actually get the, these materials uh, scaled and implemented uh, in, into uh, actual rocket motors. So embedded wires. Embedded wires are sometimes used in solid propellants to increase the effective burning. They increase the uh, heat conduction along those wires. So think of a propellant with some, could be copper, or aluminum wires, whatever. And as that heat conduction is improved, it creates these kind of cones, these divots. Um, the inert wires can be problematic, though. There's dead weight. They, they wait. Uh, they leave slag behind. They have clunky uh, products that go out through your nozzle, um, could you know, corrode your nozzle or, or, or erode your nozzle. Uh, so what about reactive wires or uh, pyrotechnics? This is 50% uh, uh, aluminum, 50% uh, Teflon, and we made this into a foil. This is just burning by itself. We've uh, looked at uh, putting different wires into propellants and comparing them. The copper wire is just a baseline uh, inert wire. Uh, there's a nickel aluminum foil that's a commercial product. Well, it's vapor deposited, uh, nanoscale layers of nickel and aluminum. Those are, uh, that forms an intermetallic uh, reactive material. Um, and in fact, that material is used for a lot of applications, including welding of big screen TVs and stuff. So um, it's a commercial product, very fast burning uh, reactive. Pyrofuse is another intermetallic self alloying reaction uh, that's used in igniter systems. And then this uh, material, again, is the mechanically activated. So we've uh, pounded in, uh, in this case, Teflon inside of aluminum. We made that into a kind of a foil or a wire and, uh, and uh, put that into a propellant. So how we do the experiment is we um, have a strand of propellant that we've cast this foil or wire. We put a window here so we can see what the effect of, uh, of that uh, wire or reactive wire uh, is and, uh, and this this is an, uh, a video of uh, four different tests. On the left is the baseline copper wire. Yeah, you can see how it forms this V that increases the surface area and, and therefore increases the effective burning rate. So higher surface area that uh, regresses back, that means that you're you'll have more of that propellant burning up at a faster rate. This is the nickel aluminum foil. It's a nano structured uh, layered uh, material. And uh, it's going much, much faster. You, you really have a hard time seeing the V structure. It shoots down through the propellant. Uh, pyrofuse is a little bit slower. And the aluminum, our aluminum Teflon uh, uh, foiled material is pretty fast, but maybe a little bit slower than, uh, than the pyrofuse. The disadvantage of these materials is they, they all produce uh, products that are, uh, 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 and in all their cases, are basically non-reactive and uh, form uh, big clunky particles that go out through your nozzle. In this case, the particles disperse into aluminum. And as I mentioned before, propellants often use aluminum anyway. So it, it'll, it'll form small droplets and small particles that uh, are often used in uh, propellants anyway. So this shows you some of the, the, the products that come off from, from these, these types of experiments. And, um, and this is the aluminum uh, Teflon type of material that forms a small uh, dispersive type of thing. So I want to talk about additive manufacturing. And so why, why do we want to do that in, in propellants? Uh, we can do, uh, so typically propellants are cast. And you have molds. And, and it's, it's, uh, there's only a f uh, you know, simple geometries that you can work with. If you could print that, those geometries, you go much more complex. 
Likewise, you could think about combining uh, pyrotechnic or, or reactive wires and so forth inside the propellant, and that could enable uh, other kinds of uh, capabilities and, and increase the amount of propellant that you could have in a, in a rocket motor. Also, you could fabricate on demand. So you, you need a certain type of uh, rocket motor, you could print, print that as, as is needed. Uh, these materials are, are highly viscous. When you mix up a solid propellant, uh, think of that as like cookie dough. So it's, it's quite viscous, especially if you're trying to maximize the amount of sugar in your cookies, right? And this, we're trying to maximize the amount of oxidizer in our propellants uh, for performance. Well, that works against being able to deposit that and build up 3D structures. Um, so that's challenging. And the current 3D printing methods restrict the kinds of materials it's like, oh, we really can't use the binder that we'd like, the polymeric uh, component holding this together because the viscosity is too high. Uh, we'd like something that's thermal, um, you know, softening that, that will work better. Or, uh, you know, we'll, uh, you will have to restrict the amount of solids that we put in the propellant uh, so that uh, we have a poor performing uh, propellant. Uh, so increasing the solid fraction, that increases the surface area that has to be bound together with the, the binder. Uh, the viscosity increases uh, uh, with that. And uh, I think I'll move along. So you would think, well, maybe what we do if we're, if we're thinking about uh, printing this viscous material with uh, a nozzle is that maybe we'll just increase the pressure. So if we increase uh, the pressure of a highly solid loaded uh, viscous material, those particles can bind together and the pressure could succeed at extruding just the binder, so it de-wets. Um, and, 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 and it requires, and, and that rapidly increases uh, as you go to smaller and smaller nozzles. Um, and you have to have smaller particle sizes for you know, finer nozzles uh, and, and, lot, and, and this local frictional heating, there's all sorts of problems. So this is kind of the ideal thing. Ideally, we'd like to be able to go to at least 80%, uh, certainly higher. Uh, high solids loading for solid propellants are like 88, 90%. Uh, we want the printed form to hold the shape. We want little thermal effect because we don't want to heat these materials up because they're propellants, right? They'll ignite. Um, we want to be able to precisely turn it on and off the flow uh, to control you know, dimensional tolerances. We want it to be scalable, low cost. Uh, we want low, no porosity in the final parts. If our propellant has porosity, the flame's going to get into those, those small gaps, pressurize, open up cracks, and then again, it's an explosive, it's no longer a propellant or a rocket. So we developed a new technology recently that satisfies uh, uh, all of those pretty well. We started off with just a cheap printer. This is like a $400 uh, FDM printer. We took all the FDM parts off, added a nozzle, we have a, a a low uh, back pressure, and the, the secret sauce is uh, a, a vibration on the nozzle. So people say, well, people have, you have looked at putting piezos and vibrating nozzles, this is nothing new. Well, how you do that exactly is, is new, and in addition, we use the vibration not only to enable the flow, but we actually turn it on and off the flow with the vibration. So we have a low, uh, low pressure that's not enough to move the viscous material, and then when we apply the vibration, uh, that enables the flow. So you're all engineers, you probably learned this even in high school, friction is all about a normal force and friction coefficient. So most people when they, they look at, this is called direct right, they want really low friction coefficient nozzles. In this case, we really don't care. Because how we're decreasing the friction is actually momentarily decreasing the normal force as that wall vibrates. And that decreases and then it, it will slip down, sort of like a snake swallowing a mouse, I guess. Um, and I'll show you some imaging of that. We've used microscale uh, x-ray imaging. This is uh, an exaggerated image of the vibration. It doesn't vibrate that much. But what we've done is taken a high-speed image and then apply some uh, data analysis to exaggerate so we can look at the modes that, of that vibration. And that gives you an idea, and, it, and it, like I said, the regular video doesn't show that much vibration. It's an optical technique. This shows the flow control. We can turn on and off on a dime. Um, and as we, we change the, the, the pressure, we can change the flow velocity, change the vibration, we can change the flow velocity, we can turn things on and off very quickly. 
this is, um, you see the scale here, that's a U.S. quarter. Um, this is a little sailing ship uh, printed with Sculpey clay. And when that comes out, there's no UV or anything. That's just a highly viscous clay. It has a yield point. So once it comes out, it, it stays in that form. Uh, the nozzle size is about 500 microns, about a half millimeter. Um, there's no viscous printer that could print anything like that. So looking at propellants, uh, this is hand mix. We, we use a residine, it's a vibrational uh, type of mixing, get some good structure. Uh, we can look at printing parameters like incre you know, the, the, the printing rate and so forth, and we can get uh, a very good strand of propellant printed. This is a micro CT, and the printed is better than just uh, hand cast. Here's some printing. Should have said that the, the printing with the, the ship was obviously accelerated. This is, this is regular speed, so it doesn't print that fast on a little ship. Uh, but these are very nice, and uh, you know, what I would consider very nice is I can take that propellant up to pressure, and it doesn't explode, because there's, there's, there's very few voids there. So this is, uh, this is burned at one atmosphere. One atmosphere is relatively easy to uh, be well, you know, to work well. Uh, but at, at pressure, importantly, uh, it burns, uh, burns well. If we add porosity, though, we can uh, make that, uh, that strand explode. So we can introduce porosity if we want, uh, or have cases that even at pressure that burn in a normal fashion as you, as you would like. So in this case, we have a fully dense case. So this is burning like a normal propellant. It'll get down to this region, and we've intentionally uh, printed some voids in, into that sample. And there it goes, almost, once it gets down there. There, so it <laughs> shoots down through the propellant and basically explodes that. Um, so, and we're, we're applying this to a wide range of different types of applications, not just propellants, uh, printing ceramic materials that can be later uh, heated, um, any kind of high solids loaded uh, material. Uh, another uh, printing uh, approach is fused deposition uh, modeling. And how many of you have used that before, like maker bots, those types of things? Okay, a few of you. We use it all the time to make you know, little parts in our lab and little structures or, or whatever. You can you know, make toys even uh, and, and you know, useful, useful parts. Um, but they're, they're typically you know, mostly just plastics, uh, like ABS. Uh, and they come on these, these filaments and they go into a nozzle that's heated and you build up a part. Like I said, my, my world's all about combustion. I like to burn things. So I want uh, a filament that's reactive. So this is ABS, and, and this is a, a Purdue symbol. And this is an aluminum uh, PVDF, which is another fluoropolymer. We picked PVDF because we just looked up the melting points of fluoropolymers, and, uh, and uh, that had the right melting point. So first of all, we have to mix the aluminum. Uh, with the PVDF, and we have several methods of doing that. And uh, we make uh, little pellets, and then we put those pellets in a filament maker. That's just a commercial fil uh, filament maker. You can buy those actually to recycle your, your printed parts if you want, and uh, make new filament to, to print in your uh, FDM printer. Uh, but we use it to make you know, a novel uh, uh, filament. And then we can take that filament, put it into a MakerBot or whatever, and, and print up uh, reactive parts. This is a little printed puck. Uh, it shows that it's reactive. And this is, uh, this is actually just a, a filament here that you ignite it. It's producing a lot of carbonaceous and also aluminum fluoride uh, products. Um, so as you see here, we could print reactive wires. Uh, we're moving towards, and I showed you, uh, a reactive uh, wires, if you will, in solid propellants. You can think about printing the solid propellant and the reactive wire together. Uh, hopefully, in the next month or two, we'll, we'll be doing that. Uh, we also have a new project spinning up where we're exploring uh, smart, multifunctional energetic materials with piezoelectric properties. So we're all about novel materials that have all sorts of multifunctionality to them. 
So you could think about your propellant that is also uh, has embedded elements that, that could be sensors. Um, it could uh, uh, be activated by external uh, fields uh, to introduce fractures into the propellant to have different functionality, changing the burning rate uh, or, or detonation even. So we call that piezoenergetics. So it would be a new area. So we've, we've, we've continually look at a wide range of options to tailor performance, uh, improve uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, environmental impact, and optimize energy materials. Um, showed very quickly a, a new technology to print very high, uh, high dense, high solids loaded materials with, uh, that are very viscous. Uh, with no, no cheating. So if you talk to the vendors of conventional uh, uh, direct write, which is like nozzle printed types of additive manufacturing, they say, well, we had one company say that viscosity is just a number. Okay, well, it's a number that matters. And you know, if you have a certain size, you want to be able, you know, you want to be able to print as high, high solid fluid as you can, high viscosity as, as possible. Um, that, that approach could be applied to any, anything with a nozzle. I think we can improve uh, the functionality of that by uh, instantaneously minimizing or decreasing the, the friction. Um, and then we've showed that we can change the microstructure and affect combustion behavior. Um, and there's, there's a wide range of applications beyond uh, energetic materials. And uh, future directions are to bring you know, different pieces of all this together, uh, piezoenergetics, reactive wires, and so forth. So with that, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to uh, the seminar and uh, spending a little bit of your afternoon here. And I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. I think I'm out on time. Ten minutes for questions. Very good. I'm glad I left, left, left time. Because, yes? Printing, what's the layer strength like? Because I know that's a major issue. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Ones. Yeah, we're looking at that really, really vigorously now. Um, and I mean, there's a couple, you know, and that, that's, that's, you know, a lot of times uh, there's UV cured binders. And the, and the problem with that is when you, when you cure a layer, uh, if you print things that, that aren't uncured, then you apply the, the curing either heat or, or, or whatever, then the layer to layer will inter, inter, intertwine and that layer to layer adhesion may be pretty good. But if you have a UV cured uh, uh, binder, then you, then you kind of close off those, those uh, molecules for binding to the next layer and that could be a huge problem. Um, for the FDM, we've, uh, my colleagues actually published a, a paper recently on not even energetic, but just you know FDM, and it came up with all sorts of mechanical testing of uh, quantifying. Okay, if you if you print different orientations, how does it affect uh, uh, the the strength? So that, that's a real key issue that, that we need to look at. But there are ways. I was just just this week talking to a colleague that say you ha you have a UV cured, so you may and so you, for UV cured, you put the polymer down, and then you you know, apply UV light, and that that uh, cross-links the polymer and, and it makes that, that interface, which could be very problematic. There are ways you can, you can bring in, uh, um, I think he was saying you take an ionized gas and open up those links. So what I think going forward might be good to make sure you, you minimize those problems is uh, to do that to improve the, the layer to layer adhesion. Uh, we haven't seen like direct problems. Okay, that's a, that's a huge issue because most of what we've we've done, we haven't completely cured it every layer. So we, we have the final material and then uh, then cure the whole material at once. And I think that's going to be minimal. And the FDM looks pretty good. It's it's melted and the next layer kind of melts and, and and bonds pretty good. But that's a that's a really really good question and and something that we're we're very well focused on. And it may depend on the kind of polymers too. So there may be some polymers that if you will, adhere to themselves well, right? And they, they chemically bond to the layer to layer. But I think that's a, that's a really, good, really good point and something that we're starting to think about a lot. Yes? When you're ball milling the aluminum in the PTFD, mm -hmm. um, how are you avoiding premature oxidation of oh. aluminum particles? I, yeah, you, you really need to, especially for that system because you have the, the Teflon and the aluminum and yeah, guess what, those are reactive. Uh, first of all, 
we, you know, for, for that system especially, and for really all the ball milling we do, we do it remotely because we actually, we, we use a specs mill in that case, so it's a, a plastic container with the, the ball mills. We have different ball mills for different applications for that. We, we have uh, kind of a plastic container with this, the ball mills in there. We, um, uh, we, we put an inert gas. That'll help to some extent, but it doesn't need any uh, oxidizer. Uh, and we actually take it to reaction. So we see where the cliff is. We blow it up. Okay, and it, it's, it's violent. It's like, okay, that's, you know, we want to stay away from that. We back off from that and, uh, and carefully look at, we back off a, a lot from that. We know where our, our, our limit is on, you know, the time of milling and so forth. And then we back off from that a lot and then we look at how much of that material is reacted as we change the, the milling time or milling parameters. We, we use a, a, a DSC TGA, differential scanning calorimeter and thermogravimetric analysis to see Okay, what are we doing in terms of the onset of exo exothermicity and, you know, are we cutting into the energy by this uh, premature oxidation? So you have to watch that very carefully. And it's a safety issue as well. Excellent question. Great questions. Anybody have even, even, even an un, you know, a question that's not as great as those two? It'd be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you find that, um, was there any optimal equation between the, the space allowed between the layers or um, anything related to what particles you're using? The general question, the answer is yeah. I mean, it makes a, a big difference. Like, and I'll, I'll give an example of, um, so like the, the nanofoils, I mean, that's not, you know, material that we make. Uh, as those are deposited, if, as you go thinner and thinner, you know, the, the, uh, the inner layer space, right? You make thinner foil materials. Uh, the, the, the propagation speed will go you know, faster and faster. But you get to a point where uh, even you, you deposit the layers, there's a little bit of partial reaction that occurs and, and, and it'll start to slow down. And you'll have uh, partially reacted the material. So there's often, in general, an optimization of, of, of the layer thickness and so forth. For nano aluminum particles or nano aluminum particles, um, aluminum will form a passivation layer, an oxide coating, right? So if, if you, you scratch aluminum, it will oxidize uh, quickly and form maybe a uh, four to six nanometer thick uh, passivation layer. layer. Uh, for particles, you have the same thing. So micron aluminum, that four to six nanometer thickness for you know 30 micron particle, do the math, it's like 1%, you know, don't worry about that. But for a nanoparticle, and, and, and by nano, I'm, I'm thinking like under 100 nanometers, uh, you get down to 50 nanometers and all of a sudden half your aluminum is already oxidized. So you're, you're bringing to the game, you, you threw away half of your fuel, which is, you know, and so you, uh, you have to compromise there. So I'd like smaller particles to increase the kinetics, have more surface area, shorter diffusional distances, uh, but I don't want to go sm that so small that I, I'm losing energy. Or you could look at strategies of, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, coatings on the aluminum so you avoid the passivation. And there's a couple companies actually that make um, nano aluminum particles that uh, in situ into a binder system that have these coatings on it that, that avoid the oxide altogether. And we're actually looking at some of those materials and, and uh, putting those into propellants and also doing our ball milling with that, that, that polymer uh, material and, and introducing those inside the aluminum particle. So we do you know, the bottom up, you know, the in situ formed nano aluminum particles and the top down milling process to form uh, micron sized particles with nanoscale inclusions. Yeah. So that, that, that's an excellent question too. Yeah, and that you always, you're always juggling that. And, and again, with, with safety too. Right? Nanoscale thermites, for example, uh, can just be really, really, as, as John well knows, I'm sure, uh, uh, electrostatic discharge sensitive um, uh, and, and in friction impact. Micron size powders of thermites are really difficult to ignite, very insensitive. So you may uh, you know, pick a size where you have the right balance. You know, less sensitive, or adequately insensitive, and a higher uh, regression rate, or burning rates, or uh, reactivity that you're after. 
Uh, and there's other ways to control that as well. So if you have really fine part particulate, you may bring in a, a binder or other material that will uh, desensitize it adequately and um, so forth. All right. Steve, thank you so much for giving a very well, easy to understand introduction to the very complicated research. I'm pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine that there is a company which uh, uh, can produce like energetics. So, so your, your student has a company. Yeah. Do they sell the product? Uh, they're working towards that. So they've got a, you know, it, it's, it, they're at an interesting point right now. So he's, um, he's been working on, with this company. He started the company two or three years ago. And their first objective was uh, to, to, to deal with the issue of, of the coating. You know, and I, you know, we knew that. We, we, did, we, could, we could have tested the rocket motors at, at Purdue. But it's like, that's not safe because we knew it oxidized slowly, that's gonna heat up. I don't want you know, small strands, oh, that's okay. You know, you know, we can, you know, if it inadvertently uh, ignited, we could deal with that, but not in a motor. So he, he solved that problem and did these, uh, there were four inch diameter uh, rocket motor tests, and that looked really, really good. And so now, what, you know, the question is going forward, uh, you know, what happens? There's one possibility that uh, a large company could say, okay, we're just going to uh, license the technology or buy the company. That's one possibility. Another possibility, and he's uh, working towards this uh, uh, as well, of uh, being able to, uh, you know, uh, you know, make the powders and then sell that. And so that's and to scale that. And so he's actually got in partners uh, to scale the coding method that he developed, and he has a patent on the coding method, and um, and also the quantities. And, and a good question would be is like, well, can you get good quantities of aluminum lithium? Um, and I mean, you can, you can get small quantities. You can just look it up. You, yeah, you can buy the, the aluminum lithium that, that we did, but it's very, it's very expensive because nobody makes large quantities of it because there's no application. But the question is, could you get large quantities? And it's really the same question you have for uh, lithium-based batteries. And the answer seems to be, yeah, there, there's, there are resources for lithium that you can get. And then, and then form the alloy. Uh, the aluminum lithium, so we, we started off with you know, Sigma Aldrich, just you know, order it online, we get a small amount, we pay a lot. Um, and we started with that, and that was fine for you know, tiny, tiny samples. But then we decided we wanted you know, kilograms of this, how, how do we get that? And the only source that we could find was actually ch uh, China. And so we bought you know, several kilograms for China, which is, it's a long story I'll tell you over dinner about buying the aluminum lithium from China, it was, it was crazy. Uh, but he's, you know, my, my, my former student has um, uh, identified partners to make the aluminum lithium in bulk and also to, to scale up the, the coating. So I think he's solved the two big problems. So if you're, gonna, you're thinking about being an entrepreneur, you've you know, got to identify what the, the, the real problems are and, and figure out how you're going to solve that. One was, you know, it's, it's not totally stable, and I, I, I think he's done that. And then uh, he's still working on the scaling. So I have a group of students here. They are looking for some sort of fuel so for their first year project. Mm -hmm. So they want to buy some like a sort of fuel, like a packet or a propellant or uh, right. Yeah. I, I don't know what you can buy in Canada, but in the U.S. you can certainly buy um, you know the ingredients for solid propellants. I would I would you know caution you to be very very careful. <laughs> make sure make sure you get people involved that are um, very experienced. There's, there's uh, high-powered rocketry clubs, at least in the U.S., uh, that a lot of my students have become involved with, and, and they have uh, certifications on safety and those kinds of things. Uh, in the U.S., there's a company like Firefox that you can buy uh, propellant ingredients. I do know there's a, uh, so I don't know if they sell for like uh, hobbyists, but they, they, there's certainly uh, companies, I thought there was one in uh, Toronto that, that sells rocket motors for hobbyists, I'm not sure. I know there's a company, Cesaroni, I think, in, in uh, Toronto. I don't know what they, how, what they sell though. Uh, maybe I can talk to you guys after, but in Canada making solid fuels is a little bit more restrictive than... Yeah, I imagine it would be, well. yeah. So you gotta, you gotta become US citizens and then come yeah. down. But. <laughs> as like a uh, secondary 
strengthening agent, say in the uh, rubber matrix. So I know in concrete you can use metal wires to yeah. uh, in as part of the aggregate and as a instead of rebar. Have you looked at doing this and seeing what the properties it would be if they're more randomly uh, distributed rather than sort of? That's an excellent question. Yeah, I think um, the answer is no. We haven't done that, but it's certainly something that, uh, like like I said before, the layered layer adhesion and, and more generally the mechanical properties of the, of the printed structure need to be looked at. And what you're saying is, is, is well taken. And, and people have put inert wires in propellants and then randomly oriented. So like, sort of like staples, like little, little chunks of stuff. And uh, uh, that certainly would affect the mechanical properties as well. So like in general, you have to quantify the mechanical behavior and the combustion behavior, the whole, whole thing. Because, you know, every material almost is, is multifunctional. And so you gotta make sure you, you, you cover both that. But that's, that's an excellent point as well. All right, I think that was the last question. That's what I said. Does, does somebody yeah. have a really quick question? Or if not, perhaps we can uh, discuss with Dr. Sun after. But please join me in thanking him for a very yeah. Thank you.